uh, beads and beads uh, and balls before. So this is a very nice time to listen to nuts now. <laughs> and uh, more than nuts, it's about packing nuts, so it's even more interesting perhaps. So, uh, you know, this uh, kind of work on monkeys has some, uh, you know, uh, more than its media value. It's mostly for anthropologists and animal behavior people. And uh, uh, we had this notion uh, among researchers that uh, uh, humans are the only species who use tools. And uh, it became a big news a couple of decades back when people discovered that chimpanzees use tools. And then there were, you know, studies on different animals with respect to tools. And crows use tools. So chimpanzees make, use sticks to get uh, termites out of termite uh, hills. Then crows use sticks to get insects out of uh, worms out of uh, crevices in trees. And monkeys use leaves, for example, as toilet paper. And some of them, you know, when they want to sneeze, they take a stick and put in their nose and sneeze the way we, uh, we sneeze sometimes. So, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, tool use. And there have been lots of studies, hundreds of studies, this animal uses this tool, this animal uses that tool. And this is the argument from the animal behavior people side that, you know, tool use is pretty common uh, across uh, animal species and families and genres. And there's another stream of research from the physical anthropologist who have been looking at what, what is special about human tool use. And since we are like, we are evolved humans and then there are animals like apes, chimpanzees and monkeys, mostly primates, we have this uh, hominid ancestors missing in between. So since the ancestors are missing, they have left in, our in their heritage these tools for us. So this is the oldest uh, tool available uh, you know, from our site and uh, these tools are around 250,000 years old. Yes. So these are around 250,000 old uh, tools. Then you have another set of tools which are around uh, like 100,000 years old which you see are a bit fine as compared to these tools. So these tools are a bit gross in structure, then you have more fine tools. And then these tools are 40,000 years, 40, years old. These are bone needles, and you can actually sew leather with these tools. And then you have tools in the early 1900s, which we still use. And then again, you have these tools, which we use now, including computers. Now if you see the transition between these tools, all five of these, a very common thing is that there's a trend here between these five that there's an increasing spatial or temporal organization of movements. So those tools, the previous tools, which are the oldest ones, are made very gross. While making them, you just need a stone or just break it into two. To make these tools, which are a bit more uh, sophisticated, you need to uh, be more, bit more precise in making them. And the precision keeps on increasing in making those tools as well as using those tools for things. So, so what's increasing is task-specific spatio-temporal organization of movements. And that is what anthropologists argue, that that's very unique to humans. And animals, they use tools very grossly. They, don't, they cannot organize in space and time the movements. And what that ability is, that is dexterity. Dexterity is about making corrections in movements based on the outcome of movements. And most of the times, when we use a tool or whatever movements you're talking about, dexterity develops during the later stages. So when I start with something, you know, using a screwdriver, I'm not dexterous. Over the time, when I practice, I become dexterous in using that tool. So, dexterity is the main thing in the, in the hominid tool evolution. Now, what if monkeys have dexterity in using tools, or, or any other animals? So where will our perspective shift, shift in terms of how we, you know, look at tools, or how we look at human evolution, and how we'll, uh, you know, shift the focus our, of our research from just looking at the specificity of tool use or the, the form of tool use to actually looking at movements. So if you look at this as a monkey, where I think I'll, I'll switch on the light here. Uh, do we have sound here? So just, uh, so there's a nut there. <laughs> so this is Mancino, and Mancino's body mass is 3.44 kg. And that stone is 3.7 kg. So it's actually holding a stone which is more than uh, its own body mass. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now, <coughs> so these nuts are actually very tasty. I was uh, <laughs> so I was there. I was there in Brazil this summer, and you know these. Uh, so you cannot underestimate these nuts. So I'll I'll tell you about how humans perform. You know, while cracking these nuts at the you know later slides. But they are very, very hard. It's just impossible to crack these nuts with a small stone or with a hand. Just impossible. So uh, there are uh, many kinds of nuts which monkeys crack. And one of the nuts is this tukum nut. Now tukum nut is very unique in terms of it has multiple shells. So if, the, if you look at the green, uh, which one do I need to press for this uh, laser thing? Yeah. So if you look at this, uh, this green nut, the, the, it has a green shell which is a bit soft. When you strike it, it cracks a bit. If you strike it, uh, you know, softly. If you strike it more, you have the shell which you can remove manually or using mouth. And then there's a hard shell, much hard shell than this green shell. And if you crack that shell, there's a, there's a kernel inside. And that kernel is actually pretty soft. Now, the peak force at failure, which is the static load force to crack this nut is around 5.57 kilonewton, which is a lot. Now, the monkeys crack these nuts. So if they crack, you know, just like uh, they have this uh, map of uh, uh, striking and they don't know about the movements or the quality of the, the, the properties of the nut, they just keep on banging it, you know, with as much force as they can with any particular stone. But that's not the case. What monkeys did, so I have this as a, I can present as a hypothesis, but, you know, this is what I found out after analyzing and, you know, I just wrote it for the article. So, so if you have an intact nut and you strike it, and you have this hull which is partially breached. So what happens is that since it is partially breached, if you crack it hard, you don't know what's going to happen inside and you might crash the kernel. So you need to you know, reduce the force a bit so that you strike it gently. You have this kernel out, you have this uh, hull breached. And then you increase the force because you have a shell which is much harder than that. And then again, since it is cracked half, you need to reduce the, the force of the strike, otherwise the kernel, the, the kernel will smash again. So you need to moderate in a particular fashion to get the kernel intact. If you don't do that, you'll smash the kernel and that's gone. And that's what the monkeys do. So I looked at the two parameters of the strikes. One is the height to which the monkeys raise the stone. And the other is the force, uh, the velocity with which they bring them down. Because force of strike is actually the kinetic energy. It finally depends on the velocity of the strike, but still height is a parameter. It may or may not influence this, the velocity. So this is uh, a nut from a close-up uh, video. So you see, the, you know, it just removed the hull. In this case, it removed in one strike. And then you have this shell, which is cracked half, then fully cracked. And you know, the nut is with the monkey. Now I'll show you the analysis. So this is a monkey, and there's a tukum nut. And here you can see this graph. The y-axis is the velocity of the stone, and x-axis is the time. Now. Let this monkey. Now, meanwhile, I'll, I'll tell you there are a couple of components which are required to crack this nut. There's this anvil. So monkeys very intelligently select these anvils. They are only particular anvils which they use. Then they they look for some holes in the anvils where nut stabilizes, and they have a choice of stones. They just don't crack nuts with any you know any random stone. So now you see the monkey will lift the stone, bring it down. The hull is partially breached. Since hull is partially breached. We'll expect in the next strike, it should strike it with less force. This is a slow motion view, so we need to wait a bit. And now again, you have the stone going up. You can see that there's a decrease in velocity of the stone, the maximum velocity of the stone when it brings it down. And then, you have this hull breached finally, and you have the inner shell, which is harder. There's an increase in force. It comes down. And there's one more strike, which is required to crack the nut. And there's a very, this, this strike is smaller than this strike in terms of force. And there, the nut is there. So yeah, they do, they do, they do crack nuts dexterously. And uh, this is the data, which I don't need to go. These are four stage, stages of of cracking nuts, and these are different monkeys in the top half. And if you see, uh, they 
so here for example when the hole is breached completely you the height we expect uh, should increase and you you majority of the cases they do increase the height so similarly it ha it's there for all four cases now what it means is that they crack these nuts which is the tukum nuts by repeatedly striking them with moderate force and not by just you know striking them forcefully once and they vary the kinematic kinematic parameters of the strikes by looking at what happens to the nut eventually and why would they do it again simple explanation because repeatedly striking the nut with moderate force is energetically more efficient as well as it reduces the likelihood of cracking the kernel now that's again we don't know whether that's really true whether that's true for the monkey that looks the case for us so we studied monkeys cracking another nut which is a pisava nut now pisava nut is twice more resistant to cracking than the earlier nut it's very hard it has multiple kernels and whatever you do with this nut you know with like i tried a lot you cannot uh, smash the kernel even the kernel is very hard you have this nuts in different forms so what we would expect is that monkey should keep increasing the force with which they strike these nuts rather than modulating it and they should use a bigger stone and they should you know take lift it higher and bring it with the more velocity and not follow that particular algorithm that is indeed the case we gave monkey the same stones to crack these nuts and what we see was that the monkeys when there's no effect the monkeys keep in uh, you know there's you don't see any increase even when there's no effect because the monkeys are hitting with their maximum potential so with the maximum height they can lift that stone with the maximum velocity they can bring it down and so if i ask you you know how many strikes will you crack will you take to crack this nut it should be more than the other nut which was softer but that's not the case they actually take more strikes to crack the softer nut than this harder nut which they are cracking it with the maximum force they can use and same is the velocity you know and the and the height the they are maximizing the parameters rather than uh, using them dexterously so you know finally what you see is that there are two nuts which differ in their properties and which differ in how you should crack them and monkeys indeed do like that so what it means uh, in terms you know for for our studies in human evolution is that this particular skill of uh, you know organizing movements in time and space and the parameters of those movements is not specific to humans it actually dates back to new world monkeys so what's now with the with the research in physical anthropology and animal behavior so what we suggest is that, to them is that they should change the focus of research from just specificity of tool use or just looking at tool use than to real movements since this was a first study and we are you know currently in the process of writing a couple of reviews uh, on how and taking things from embodied uh, cognitive science and ecological psychology and making some predictions about how to go ahead with uh, animal tool use research and uh, sorry so if you look at this nut cracking task you are cracking a nut with a stone there are three kinematic parameters which uh, need to be uh, managed one is the point where you strike the nut because if you strike it at a different point the nut will not escapes and you lose the nut the kinetic energy of the strike and the angle of percussion of the strike with respect to making uh, uh, with respect to making stone stone tools while napping stones there are a couple of more parameters but the degrees of freedom remain same so what it turns out that it is the number of parameters which animal uh, which uh, an individual is controlling and the degrees of freedom uh, the way that uh, you have to manage while controlling those parameters that actually matters in terms of the evolution of these skills and tool use so when i did this uh, you know study and uh, we got a good publication and media attention like i was pretty happy that this is a big mountain of work and then i started reading about this ecological psychology literature and bonstein books of uh, book on dexterity and its development and you know uh, my dreams got shattered and this was it <laughs> and you know there's a lot more to do and uh, now you know this is the holy grail here so you have movements and uh, i'm pretty much convinced that they are definitely constrained by body task and the environment and uh, so what i'm planning now is that in terms of body i'm looking at uh, i'm giving monkeys different stones and different nuts and i'm looking at their different joint angles so if i if i crack a nut using different stones how do you know in time different joint angles change and based on how you know so for example if i'm using my abdomen more than my shoulders so i should see an effect with the abdomen and not in the shoulders and comparing that with the same joint angle trajectories in humans and see that how the the movement of those trajectories differ between the two and what we hypothesize is that the the overall 
a way we, we do percussion is shifting from abdomen to shoulders in humans. So monkeys use their sh abdomens and humans tend to use their shoulders more. And it's, it's busy, easy to conclude from that that humans will be able to you know, more precisely modulate the movements than monkeys since the monkeys are using their abdomen. So even uh, you know, what you can do with the tool depends on what part of the body you are using or how you are using it. Now in terms of the task, I am looking at uh, the dynamics or dynamics, you know, this is a Canville ball game if you know of. It pretty much translates into managing degrees of freedom. So I'm looking at uh, hammering uh, task in humans. And uh, so if you know when we hammer, so we, we take a hand up and then we bring it down. We just don't strike it like this. What monkeys are doing it, they're taking stones like from here and, you know, crashing it now down. But we actually first make a trajectory. So that trajectory, that's my hunch that it allows us to, you know, uh, fixing some degrees of freedom and since some degrees of freedom are fixed it's easy to learn the task and and is easy to learn the overall uh, uh, parameter values which we need to manage and in terms of the environment uh, my research group is studying the socio ecological correlates of this uh, nut cracking so what they have found in the previous research or and the continuing research is that it's not just uh, this task for a monkey to learn this task is take around 4 years it has to be in the vicinity of adults. It has to play with the you know, existing cracked nuts, uh, uh, you know, shells. And uh, how it develops is that first individuals, you know, start, you know, tasting some nuts. So they have some desire for nuts. And then they have this uh, cracked nuts with them. Then they keep banging nuts over some surfaces. Then they have two nuts in their hand. They keep banging two nuts over them. Then they pick up stones. They bang one nut over a stone. But then there's an inhibition. You have to keep the nut back to hit it with a stone. But they want nut in their hand because they are afraid to lose it. So finally they you know, lose this inhibition, they keep the nut down, then they have stones, but then again the, the, the mass of the stone which they can hold is again limited by the size of their body. Then eventually they practice and practice, and juveniles may take around 76 strikes to crack a nut, which adults take only 4. And what's more interesting is that this summer we did experiments with people, and those people included two types of people. One was scientists, these are all professors from University of Chicago, Washington University and all these places. And they are all specialists in material properties of biological, uh, you know, uh, like plants and tissues and uh, nuts. And there were novices, which are like, you know, uh, these are novices, sorry. And there's another, uh, the natives there, which sometimes crack nuts for their food. So monkeys, you saw that they take four nuts, around four strikes to crack, to comb nuts. And the natives there, they actually take only one strike to crack a nut, only one strike. And the scientists who are specialized in material properties, they take 20, 25 strikes to crack the same nuts. So, which again tells that this is not a very simple skill. There's much more to uh, learn about it and learn about human evolution. Yeah, so that's all about it. Thank you.